All right, cool. We're good. So, all right, so we're going to talk, as you guys know, about the Lord's Prayer. We've been focusing on this for the past couple weeks. Um, like Josh said, we're going a little out of order, but um, appreciate you guys bearing with us. And uh, I'm excited to just dig into the ending here. Um, but before I do that, I figured I would just do a quick review. Um, so, quick review, and then we'll, and then we'll dive in. So, this first little bit comes from what a lot of what Josh was um, some of his notes from the beginning. So, if you've got those, some of this might look familiar. Um, but I think it's important for us to realize that Jesus said, "How did he start this prayer off? If you pray, or sometimes when you pr- like when you pray." And so there was this expectation that he had that prayer is going to be this daily part of our lives. It's going to become a routine. It's not just going to be a a once in a while thing or when we find ourselves in trouble. But there was this expectation that he had that it's it's going to be something that is integral in your life and in the discipline of, of your daily practices. And we see Jesus exemplify this. I mean, time after time, he would you know, go up early in the morning to the mountain to pray or escape into a quiet place to pray. And his life was filled with prayer. I believe he was probably the the man that had the greatest prayer life that has ever walked this earth, right? And so what's cool is that we are learning how to pray from undoubtedly the greatest teacher that ever walked the earth who also had the greatest prayer life. So if there's anyone who can teach us about prayer, it's Jesus, right? I mean, this is like learning rocket science from, like, Elon Musk or how to, how to work your computer from Bill Gates, right? This is, like, the cream of the crop. If you want to know how to pray, pay attention. Very strongly recommend that you pay attention to what Jesus is about to say. So we know this is important. Jesus modeled the life of prayer like I have in our notes and taught us that it should be a common practice in our daily routine. Um. And I like, Josh brought this up, and I, I love this. It says, and I've got this right here in our notes, of all the things the disciples could have asked Jesus to teach them, they asked him to teach them how to pray. I mean, you think about all the um, miraculous things that Jesus did, the wisdom that he had, and, and surely there were other things that they asked him, for sure. But this was highlighted. They wanted to know, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us to connect to the Father the way that you do. Teach us to connect to heaven to hear what the Father is saying the way that you do. They recognized that the key to the power, anointing, and wisdom that Jesus operated in was through his prayer life, foundationally through his prayer life. And I love this quote. The success of anyone's ministry is directly connected to their prayer life. You know, we've got all these different conferences that we can do and all these different tactics you know I worked in youth ministry and you know if you want to bring in youth you have pizza or something right like there's all these things that we can do and and all those things are good and they're valuable and they can serve in building a church or a community or an outreach but the number one thing as Christians that we should focus on and make focal in our lives is praying is taking time to praise connecting to God in prayer and allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our lives through the power of prayer. All right, this prayer um, contains six or seven, depending if you want to break the the last two, which is what I'll be teaching tonight on, uh, up into two different ones. Um, The first three are focused on God. So we've got your name, right, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, And then your will. So your name, your kingdom, your will. The first three focus first on God. The next three then focus, uh, the petitions are focused on us. So we've got give us, right, this day our daily bread. And I have in parentheses here for you guys that this impacts the physical aspect of our lives. So when we pray for that, we're praying for the physical things in our lives. Forgive us, which deals with the relational And then what we're going to talk tonight on, deliver us, or you can throw in lead us as well, if you want to have seven there. And that focuses on the spiritual realm or the spiritual aspects of our lives. So there's these six or seven petitions. The first three focused on God. The last three or four, however you want to break it down, um, are focused on us. And I think it's just another good reminder, and Josh brought this out as well in, in the first week, that, you know, when we go to God in prayer, I think 
I mean, you can start any way you want, but I think it's an amazing thing to just start in awe and honor of who God is, right? And that's what Jesus showed here is the first thing that we are worried about, that we're concerned about when we come before God isn't ourselves, but it's saying, Lord, you are worthy, you are holy, your kingdom, your power, your glory, it's about you. And so just starting off our prayer, our prayer lives with thankfulness, with adoration, with worship, and then hitting on those, those needs that we have. Um, like, I, like I said, that you can do it either way. I'm not saying it's wrong not to do that. And there's times where maybe you just need to cry out and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me. Or Lord, touch my body. Like, I need this healing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, hear, me, hear my heart on that. But I think that Jesus did make the point to show that, like, to start off with praise, to start off with giving God glory and recognizing who he is is a powerful way to pray. Um, and I just, I have, I wanted to s- kind of bring this small point out. You know, Jesus emphasizes, or he starts off by introducing God as our Father. And we've got these petitions here, and I just noted real quick that we can ask of God and believe in faith that he'll answer us because he's a good Father, right? Because he has that identity as a Father. Matthew chapter 7, 11, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Right, And then James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So when we come before God, we're coming before a good Father. You know, whether we're coming before Him on one of the best days of our lives, when we're high up on the mountain, or we're coming before Him on a, a, a day that, hasn't gone so well, maybe we've messed up, maybe we've made some mistakes, maybe we're not feeling worthy or whatever it is, but we can come boldly before him knowing that he's a good father, that he welcomes us into his presence, and that we're going to find what we need in his presence. So I love that Jesus starts that off, our father. And then finally, and then w- and we'll, we'll end up the, uh, or we'll wrap up the review. But just a, as a reminder, this prayer was not given to us simply, to simply repeat or memorize, right? It's a model with which we can use to guide our prayer lives. Through this prayer, Jesus reveals what God is like, the principles and nature of the kingdom, and the priorities of the kingdom. Jesus is emphasizing that these should be primary themes of our prayer lives. So like Josh, you know, using the example again, talked about how this prayer is a model. It's like the, you know, the walls on which we can hang drywall. It's not something that we just simply have to repeat, though I think it's a lot of value to repeat it, to memorize it. But we can take these themes and we can expand and expound upon them and use them to really jumpstart, to to put fire on us and and to really accelerate our prayer lives. And so I've found many times where if I'm just kind of feeling like in, in like a funk where I'm like, man, I don't. You ever, like, start praying and you feel like you say the same thing, like, ten times in a row? Like, you just keep going back to that same phrase, and then you're like, I'm not making any progress here, right? Like, (laughs) sometimes when I get in in those moments, I'll just open up my Bible to Ephesians or Colossians or, you know, right here, the Lord's Prayer, these apostolic prayers, and I'll just pray this, Father, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I'll use these prayers to jumpstart that time of prayer, and often... Pretty much every time what will happen is when I am faithful to just seek after God, even in like those simple ways, and use those prayers as like a springboard, I mean, then it just kind of opens up, right, that door um, into the presence, into a place of prayer where you can just begin to commune with God in your own prayer um, and listen to what he has to say. So definitely, definitely take these and use them for, for your benefit during your prayer time. All right, cool. So. That is review. We're all caught up. You guys know exactly what's going on now, right? We're pros on the first half of the Lord's Prayer. Um, so we're going to tackle the the last petition tonight. Um, in the, I was kind of excited. I was excited to um, when we were kind of talking about which parts of the prayer we were going to teach on. I was excited to get this one, and not because I like felt like I knew everything about it, but kind of the opposite. It's one of th- it's part of the Lord's prayer that I probably felt like I knew. I don't want to say like know the least about because it's you know it's it's a phrase, 
but just had some questions about. And it, it can be one that I think is often maybe confused or just even like construed um, by some people. And so there, there could be some questions. So I was excited to, to jump into it. I don't profess that this is going to be an exhaustive teaching on all that um, you will ever learn on this, but I hope that I can give you some key things um, that will help you, and then you can also apply to further study. So let me grab, let me grab my Bible. That'd be helpful, right? All right, so lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So let's just get the the elephant out of the room, you know, kind of here. What do you think? Does God, so this, this scripture has, has given some people room to pause, has caused some people to kind of really study it, because it almost sounds as if, like, lead us not into temptation. Is there a time that God leads us into temptation? And so I want to ask the question, Number one, before we get into the words, do any word study, anything like that, does God tempt us to sin? What do you guys think? Al says, nope. No way. That settles it. <laughs> yeah, he led Jesus into the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. No, like, l so she said that he did lead Jesus. The, the Bible does say that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. But she did bring out the point that it was to be tempted by the devil. And we're going to get into that. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that out because that is one thing that a lot of people um, will look at as, well, well, God led Jesus into the wilderness, right, to be tempted. And so does God tempt us to sin? I always thought that he led him into the wilderness so that he could die to himself. But at the end of it, the enemy came and took him away. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna get we're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into that verse tonight. So that's a good point. I like that. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right. I think there was more motivation for going into the wilderness than just that time of temptation. I think there was like a, a fleshly dying, you know, that happened there. Um, and then certainly the temptation was a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah, amen. No, that's good, Al. That is really good, and we're going to get to that, so I, I love it. Um, but as Al, as Al, as you stated, no, nope, not at all. I've got this here as well that, no, James makes it clear that if we're asking the question, does God tempt us to sin, the answer to that question is definitely no, is a resounding no. James chapter 1, verse 13. Does, it, do, does anybody have their Bibles tonight? I guess I've got a lot. I guess I've got it written down, but... I'm just wondering if anyone wants to read that. And it's, like I said, it's literally on the paper, so you, <laughs> you don't need a Bible. I just want to see if uh, we can get some people reading. Scott, you want to do it? Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so James makes it clear here that God will never tempt us or entice us to sin, right? If we find ourselves in a situation where we are sinning, we can't blame God for that sin. We can't say, well, God, why did you let me do that, right? Why did you let me look at this? Or why did you let me say that? Or why did you let me walk into that place? It's not God. It's not our Father's desire for us to sin. It's not his desire to entice us to sin. It's not his desire to put us into situations where we will sin. Now, we are going to get to 
that, that verse about being led into the spirit and kind of what that means. But before we do that, I want to talk about if God is not the one who entices us or tempts us to sin, what is temptation and where does it come from? And I know these are pretty basic questions, um, but I think it's good to look at. James 1, 14 through 15 says this. Each person is tempted when he was lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So we see here that the devil is the one who causes the sin. The devil is the one who entices us to sin, who lays the trap. Now what's interesting is James and Peter both use predatory language to describe the way that sin takes hold in our lives, right? Like this, it's like a, this devil's like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. James says he's, he lures and entices us, or we're lured and enticed even by our own desire. And so I wanted to ask you guys, can you think of another time in the Bible where sin was described as this predatory kind of description of this predatory nature? In the garden. Yeah, Scott said in the garden. And I wanted to just, to just go there and, and to look at this really quick before we move on. This is Genesis chapter 4. This is the story of Cain and Abel. I know you guys all know it. And it's crazy to me that this story happens literally like one generation into human history. <laughs> like we didn't get very far. And uh, it, went, it went south pretty quickly. Chapter 4, uh, we'll, we'll start at verse, um, well, I'll just start at, uh, I'll start at verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, and listen to this, this is verse 6, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? Verse 7 says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And so God is talking to Cain Cain brings his offering to God, and in the, the Bible here, it doesn't tell us at this point why his offering was rejected. I mean, we don't know. I mean, to our knowledge, there was no um, instructions or rules at this point on, you know, proper sacrifice. Um, I've talked to Josh, and I mean, this is a side point, but that perhaps, you know, in, in the New Testament when Jesus is teaching on this, he, he's teaching about forgiving your brother before you go to the altar, and in that same context in that same verse he brings up he references the story of Cain and Abel and I've kind of wondered if maybe it wasn't even about the sacrifice so much but maybe there was something that Cain was holding a grudge against Abel was unforgiving of him so God's like hey before you bring that sacrifice before you come to me take care of what's going on between you and your brother I I'm not saying that that's what it is but it's something interesting to think about um, whether it is or not the point is secondary um, God explains to Cain, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the, do at the door. Its desire is for you. And he paints this picture of like, have you guys ever seen videos? I almost wanted to cue one up tonight, but I don't want to like offend, you know, offend anyone with uh, like uh, PETA stuff or any of that. You know, I don't know who, any vegetarians or vegans in here. But have you ever watched a video of like a, like a predator, like a cat, like out in the wild? You know, maybe like in the savanna or in the jungle, whatever. And they're like, or even just like a house cat creeping up on a mouse or something. And they all kind of do it where they're like looking for maybe like a, like a little baby zebra or something, right? Super sad, I know. But they're like, they're crouching. And like no movement is wasted, right? Like every single step that they take is like precision. Like they're honing it in. They don't waste any energy. They're, they're crouching, they're waiting. And you can watch them and they'll wait for like, an hour like they'll just sit there and wait and the second that that 
zebra or whatever it is that they're looking for, mouse, whatever, like looks away or has a moment where maybe it's not watching or on guard quite enough as it should be, boom, like lightning, right? It's, it's on them. And so God is painting this picture that that's what sin is like. That's what the enemy of our soul is like, that it's like this predatory nature that sin becomes that would literally wait for these opportune moments in our lives where we've got our guard down or whatever it may be that we give room for sin to come in. And what's interesting is it's, it starts off that, like, it's, a, it's an external, right, this external predatory nature that's looking to capture Cain. But when you give in to that, when you allow that to take over, it's like then Cain becomes that predator, right? Like he takes on that predatory um, kind of mentality, and he rises against Abel in the field, right, back in the field like a predator would do, and, and rises against his brother and kills him. So there's this serious and th- seriousness that God paints this picture that, man, it's no joke when you're messing with sin, when there's temptation. If you allow yourself to give in, to stumble, to give into that sin, if you're not careful, it will take over. And before you know it, like that very thing can be consuming you to the point that it, like you take on that very attribute. And so it's just something that I think we need to be very uh, intentional. And I think that's why Jesus made this um, part of his prayer that he said, do this often, you know, continue to keep your guard up, continue to pray that you would not be tempted, that you would not be enticed to sin and to give in to temptation. Um, all right, cool. So point number one, does God tempt us to sin? The answer ob- obviously is no. Um, we know that sin comes from the enemy and even from our own, the o- our own lust of our flesh that when we're lured, in, lured into that we give in to that. Now, as, as we had pointed out tonight, and I think it's important that we just touch on this, and I, I'm gonna only, only going to touch on it briefly. But that word here um, in Matthew chapter 6, that word for temptation, is a word, and I think I've got this right. I listened to this like five times on the Blue Letter Bible, so Josh can correct me if I'm wrong maybe, but um, is pyrosma, pyrosmos. Pyrosmos? <laughs> As I say it three different ways. Pyrosmos, I believe is how you say it. Um, that word for temptation is used interchangeably for temptation, but also for trial or adversity or testing. And so you have to look at the context of what it's used and where it's used to, to determine, is this temptation or is this like a trial that can actually be used uh, to build one up? Um, we know that God does use and does give opportunities for us to encounter trials, for us to encounter um, testing, just like Jesus being led into the wilderness. Now, like Carol brought up, he was led into the wilderness, but the Bible says that Satan was the one who tempted him. But God did give that opportunity um, for him to go into the wilderness to be tested. James 1, chapter 2 through 4 uh, brings this out. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing, and that's that pyrosmos, of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Then this is uh, Peter in his letter, 1 Peter 4, chapter 12 through 13. And, and all of these scriptures are ESV, just in case anyone's wondering about translation. Um, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial, pyrosmos, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Right, And then I've got here on the next page, we see this concept exemplified in the life of Jesus, and this is what we were talking about. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. So God did... The Spirit, right, did lead Jesus into a situation where he was tempted, but the temptation itself came from Satan. You know, I think about this, that God wants to use trials to build our faith. But when I was studying this, and I, I kind of was like wrestling with this, like, well, God, so 
you put us in these situations where we can be tempted. So, like, are you causing us to sin if we stumble? And I believe that we need to start this back from that beginning. Our father, he's a good father. He knows what's best for us, and he knows what's right. Now, as the kids get older, and I think it's going to be important for them to learn how to swim, I want Gracie to learn how to swim, right? So I'm not going to, as a good father, I'm not just going to take Gracie and go to the deep end and drop her in and say, good luck, right? Sink or swim. I mean, that's a test. That's a trial. That's going to, you know, cause her to try to swim. But it's not in a father's good nature to do that. Now, what I might do is I might push her a little bit. I might start her out in the shallow end with some floaties and little duck, you know, little cute little uh, duck inner tube on her or something. We'll get her kind of paddling around. And then as she gets a little bit better, I'll push her a little further. And I want to kind of take her outside of her comfort zone little by little so that she can increase that skill and that difficulty. And I believe that our Father, that God is going, he will test us. He will allow for us to go through trials. He will allow us to go through testing. But I believe as a good father, he knows how to do that. He knows even what we're capable of. And I believe he's going to do that in a way that's going to give us the best chance for success. That he's going to do it in a way that's going to help us grow. I don't think he wants to just throw us out in the deep end and say, good luck, son, you got this. But he's going to take us through trials, everyday trials and testing. And as we build up our faith, as we build up character and endurance and strength, we'll be able to be in a position where we can overcome greater and greater things. And so when we get into those situations, you know, uh, I believe it's Paul, or maybe it's in, in Hebrews, I can't remember, but the verse that talks about that God makes for a way of escape for us, even in the midst of trials and temptations. And so I believe as a good father, and, and I don't know if this is 100% biblical or theological, but in my mind, I believe that as a good father, God knows what we can handle. And in most situations, if he's going to lead us into a, into a place where we're going to be tested and tried, that he's got a pretty good idea that we're ready to, we're prepared to handle that test, that we're prepared to handle that trial. And if we do fail, if we do give in to sin, he's not like, well, you're done, you know, I'll move on to the next one and see if he can pass, right? He's merciful, he's loving, he's kind, he's ready to forgive us, he's ready to pick us back up and, and move on. But I believe that God does it in a way that we can, um, we can grow, that we can have success, and that he's not just going to leave us or abandon us in something that is completely way over our head. Now, we can certainly get ourselves into situations that are over our head, and then that becomes what, you know, James is talking about, what Peter's talking about, when we're lured, when we're enticed by our own desires, when we're walking in a place that we shouldn't be, right? All right, so... See, do I have anything else I wanted to say on that? I think we'll move on. So, point three here, and we're moving to the actual prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, this is what Jesus taught us. He taught us that we pray that God would lead us to escape from tempting situations. And I believe here he's referring to not to like those situations of trial or testing, but I believe that he's actually referring to um, temptation that would cause us specifically or cause specifically from the enemy that would cause us to stumble. I, I don't think Jesus would have us necessarily pray against a trial or a test that, could, that he actually wants to bring us to that would increase our endurance or increase our strength. Um, we pray that God would lead us to escape from tempting situations. This is the same request. So he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this is the same request that he's making from two different angles. The second half defines positively what the first half expresses negatively. He's telling us we want to resist, we, or we want to pray that we would not be led into these situations. Now, Jesus obviously has good reasons for wanting us to avoid temptation. And, and like I said, this isn't anything new. But first and foremost, he doesn't want us to be in situations of temptation, to be in a situation that would cause us to stumble to the point of, you know, backsliding, cause us to stumble to the point of sinning, cause us to stumble to the point of getting into a position where we've taken ourselves out of that 
uh, that place of uh, being a, a son or a daughter of God. Right, he doesn't want to lose us. He doesn't want us to fall away. So he pray. He says, "Pray that you would not enter into temptation." I don't want you to be in a situation that would take you away from me. I don't want you to be in, you know, a situation like the prodigal son, where you would be far from me and you would be running from me. And number two, he wants our hearts burning with love for him, not dull or um, complacent because of constant struggles. Even, you know, we pray not just so like. Lord, keep me from temptation because I don't want to fall away. I want, you know, not just like those kind of heavy hitting temptations, but we pray, Lord, let me not be tempted because I don't want to be constantly struggling with these things that would weigh me down. I don't want to be constantly, you know, feeling shame. I don't want to be constantly living in grief or regret from what I did. You know, I believe as Christians, many Christians walk with God. They're forgiven, right? They're on the right track, but they, they walk like, with like a burden on their back still because they've got these like little struggles that they just can't seem to to get through, right? And I've been there. And God wants the best for us. He doesn't want us to live like that. He wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to walk and to live in victory. And so he's saying, pray that that would be your lifestyle, that you wouldn't have to be weighed down by these unnecessary burdens of shame, of guilt for these constant struggles. I want you to walk in victory. I want you to walk in freedom, right? This is very important to Jesus. He said to pray like this as often as we pray. Um, and it's important that we do pray like this, kind of going back to the garden. Uh, Satan is continually looking for opportunities to ensnare us. This is Luke chapter 4, verse 13. This is after Jesus had um, completed his time in the wilderness. It says, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. That's interesting, isn't it? He's like, I'm not gone for good, but I'm waiting for another chance. I'm waiting for an opportune time. And so Jesus stressed that when we pray, when we are praying that we are constantly on guard, that we're constantly praying, that he would keep us from temptation. Now, this doesn't mean that we live in fear or that we live defeated lifestyle, constantly worried about what's coming around the next corner. Like, oh, you know, woe is me. I'm, a, you know, I'm constantly giving in to temptation. But he does want us to use wisdom and recognize the importance of keeping ourselves blameless before God. You know, the, the, when Satan left Jesus, uh, I put a note down here that temptation won't always look the same when it comes that was very clear temptation couldn't be clear devil you're in the wilderness the devil comes to you talks to you like 100 percent. this is temptation right but i think about that opportune time and you remember later on towards in jesus ministry as he started sharing with his disciples what his what the plans were and he started started sharing to them that you know the son of man is going to have to be crucified is going to be killed, is going to be betrayed. And what does Peter say to him? Is Peter like, let it be, Lord, amen. Peter says, takes him aside and he rebukes him. He rebukes Jesus, right? Like, you can't say this stuff, you're the Messiah. You're supposed to be this powerful ruler. You're supposed to be here to establish your kingdom on the earth. Like, it was completely out of Peter's paradigm. I mean, but I guess he'd already admitted before that that Jesus was Christ, but then he's having like this moment where he's like rebuking him and telling him, no, don't say these things. And what does Jesus say to him? Do you guys remember? Get behind me, Satan. And I think that was one of Satan's opportune times right there. He came in a, in a moment where Jesus could have taken a, sh where could have listened to that voice, tempted to take that shortcut, right, to have the crown without the cross. And that temptation didn't come in the form of Satan in front of him, testing him. It was, a f it was in the form of, like, someone close to him, right? His brother, right? Someone he trusted, his best friend. And so I think as Christians, we just have to have wisdom and pray for wisdom that God would, um, get, would, that God would give us wisdom to know um, when we're experiencing those times of temptation, that we would be looking um, for them. This is something that Josh 
had spoke on, gosh, this is probably years ago, but it really stuck with me, a couple, maybe like last year. Um, and, and Josh, you were talking about being tempted, and uh, he brought this out that Satan comes in, in in opportune times, and this couldn't have applied better, but um, in times where we may be hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, right? Halt. It's an easy one to remember right there. And uh, and so just as just practical things that we can do as Christians is when we're having a rough day, right, and you know kind of like end of the day comes and you're just not feeling the best, maybe you're all four of those, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, whatever. Like when you find yourselves in those situations, it's the end of the night, you're all alone, right? Maybe you're upset about something that happened. It's really easy to start dwelling on things that aren't of Christ. It's really easy to start saying, well, if that person just hadn't uh, done this, and then before you know it, you're like, you know, just thinking these like hateful or evil thoughts about these people, or, you know, maybe it's the end of the night and you're on your phone and it's easy to start just scrolling on the page and before you know what you're looking at something that you know that you should not be looking at. So these are moments when we're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that just practically, like, we can look and see, like, hey, this is a strategy. Am I in a situation where I may be giving in to temptation? Am I allowing my, my heart to become dull or my mind to become, you know, complacent uh, to, the, to these moments that Satan might present? Jesus' heart is that we would not wait until we are in the midst of temptation, but would already be in a place of prayer so that we can be prepared. We see this clearly um, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. He says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And this is Jesus talking to them in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane here. He says, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then this is uh, another scripture here from Luke chapter 21. Jesus once again talking. And he says this, but watch yourselves. Everyone, can you say watch yourselves? Watch yourselves. Lest your hearts be weighed down with uh, dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake. Everyone say stay awake. Tell your neighbor, wake up. Wake up, stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So two different times, Jesus says, watch and pray. Watch yourselves. Both of these scriptures encourage us to have this, this attitude of watching, to have this attitude of um, being uh, on the offensive. You see, watching is not this passive, uh, we'll just kind of wait and see what happens, right? But uh, it's this proactive. It's, he's encouraging us to stay alert, to stay awake, to be on guard. Not to be like just sitting there watching like, oh, here comes temptation. Hope I uh, do okay, right? Like, here it comes. But to be actively engaged in a, a spirit of prayer so that when those moments come, we can be ready. In other words, he's saying structure your life in such a way as to give the least amount of opportunity to be led into temptation. Structure your life. The things that you do, the things that you meditate on, the things that you look at, structure your life in a way that would give the least opportunity for temptation. We must go on the offensive if we want to overcome temptation is what I believe Jesus is teaching us. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, he's encouraging the church, and he says, give no opportunity to the devil. In other words, don't give him a chance to take hold in your life. Don't, you know, don't say something, don't look at something. If you know that you going somewhere is going to cause you to stumble or being around certain people is going to cause you to sin, he's saying, don't even do it. Don't put yourself in a situation. Give no opportunity to the devil. We must be on the offensive if we want to overcome temptation. You know, I think of this, I thought about this, um, this example when I was learning how to drive, right? Everybody remember the, that time learning to drive? You're 14, 15, 16 years old, right, with your parents. And I remember my dad, and you guys have probably heard this, would always say this. And my dad was like a stickler about driving and, and driving good. 
he would always say, you can't just be a defensive driver. You've got to be an uh, offensive driver, right? You can't just be someone who reacts to what's going on around you, but you have to be anticipating what's going to happen. And one of the things that he would do, and I thought it was annoying at the time, but looking back, I see the value in it. He would, like, quiz my brother and I. I've got a twin brother, so we would take turns. And he would do these, like, little quiz, like these little pop quizzes while we were driving to, to check to see if we were being offensive. And he, so we'd be driving down the road, and he would be like, hey, Derek, what color is the car behind you? And I couldn't look in the mirror. And I'd be like, red? And he's like, no, the red car turned, like, three turns ago. It's a blue one now. And I'd be like, dang it. All right, I'm going to get the next one, Dad. And we'd be, like, driving again. He'd be like, he'd be like hey, Derek, what, co- what um, sign did you just pass? Or what was the speed limit? You know, like all these questions. He would just constantly be on these to us. You know, and th- that was one of the things I remember the most. What color car? What, what's the model car that's right behind you? Don't look in the mirror. And so he was quizzing us because at th- the time I thought he was just trying to, you know, just being like an annoying dad. Like, just let me drive. I'm, I'm on the road, dad, okay? Like, we haven't crashed yet. Be happy. But he didn't want me to simply know how to drive. He wanted p- me to be able to excel at, at driving. He wanted me to be able to anticipate what was coming so that I would be able to avoid an accident so that if, you know, a car was coming in one lane and merging, that I already knew that no one was behind me on my right so I could swerve, right? Like I didn't have to think about it. And so all those things stick with me to this day. I constantly find myself trying to anticipate what the person behind me is doing or what this person ahead of me is going to do because I want to be on guard, right? I want to be aware. I don't want to get in an accident. And so... I think that's what Jesus is, is encouraging us with these prayers. Is he's saying, no, you've got to watch. You've got to be on guard. You've got to go on the offensive if you want to live a life free of stumbling. If you want to live a life free of temptation, then you can't just wait for it to come to you and try to battle it with the prayer or battle it by saying no. But you have to structure your life in such a way that you go on the offensive. And so I would just encourage you, and it, we, we all come from different walks, different um, lifestyles and such, different ages, but make it practical for you. You know, I've got friends who um, they've just, you know, they made it a rule that they don't go on um, their phone if it's after 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night. Um, you know, my, my mom and dad were always the type of people who would never want to go, like, to a meeting or, like, in the church if we were locking up alone with someone of the opposite sex if it was just them. So just, like, these practical things that you can do, Right? that you can do to, so that it minimizes any chance of temptation, any chance of stumbling, any chance of getting into these situations that would cause you to then have to experience maybe shame, have to experience guilt. So just, I would encourage you guys to make it practical. Think about the things that maybe you know in your life that in the past, right, maybe or even now that you've struggled with or that you are struggling with, and go on the offensive. Set up, if it's the time that you need to be off this, or if it's someone, if it's a group of friends that maybe you're just, you know every time you get around them it's going to go the wrong way, then just say, hey, you know, for now I, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to spend time with you guys at this point, right? Y- you might have to do that. You know, make it practical. Do whatever it takes to go on the offensive. Position yourself in a way that you are ready ahead of time. And, and I would say this takes humility, right? Because a lot of times I want to be like, well, God, I'm, I don't need to do those things. I got this, right? And it takes humility to live in this, to live in a way that would say, God, I know that I would struggle if it wasn't for your grace. I know that there are things that might tempt me, so I'm going to be willing to make changes to my life. But I believe it's worth it to humble ourselves before God, to position ourselves um, before him and just say, God, give me the grace. Give me strength. Show me practically what I need to do to avoid these situations. All right, watch and pray. The second thing that we learn um, from Matthew chapter 26, this is Jesus' prayer in the garden. So he says, watch and pray that you may not, and what does he say? That you may not what? Enter into temptation. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. And I was telling a list of this when I was preparing. When I thought about this verse, I, I've kind of always just thought about this, and maybe it's just because it's a, f- a common phrase, but I th- thought about this is that you may not fall into temptation, right? And have, have you guys heard people say that? Like, oh, man, I just I fell into temptation today, or that, that 
pastor over there, he, he fell into temptation, right? Like it's something that we fall into. And I thought about that as I was studying this. And I realized like that's not the right way of thinking about temptation, something that we fall into. You see, temptation's not something that we simply fall into. It's not this pit that we're walking out one day and all of a sudden, whoop, right? And we're like, how did I get here? Right? I just fell into it, right? If temptation is a pit, then it's got a wide stairway leading all the way to the bottom, right? It's not something that just happens one day. It's not something that we just fall into, but it's something that we deliberately step by step by step. Jesus said that you enter into it. It's a willing, it's a willing position. It's a willing state of mind when you enter into that. We willingly enter it, and we gradually step further and further in. And I think by, by wording it like that, by understanding that, it also gives us um, the, the, the understanding that we have to take responsibility. Right? When you say, I, I fell into it, well, I, you could blame your brother for that. You could blame the movie that you're watching. You blame this or that. But when you realize that it's something that you willingly entered into, it's, all right, yeah, I got to take responsibility. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that again, right? I'm not going to blame someone else. I'm not going to blame God, right? I think a lot of times we give too much credit to the devil too, like, oh, the devil made me do it, you know? But it's like you took those steps down into that pit. You took those steps willingly. What is, it, what is that old song? It's a slow fade. You guys remember that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it is. It's, it's, it's a gradual process. Temptation is a process. Look at this. Um, actually, let me have someone else read this. I feel like I've been, I've been reading and talking too much. Who can read for me Psalms chapter 1, 1 through 2? And I've got it right here on the paper. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Psalms 1, 1, 1. Thank you. Blessed is the man, and you guys notice, I underline it there, it's, there's this progression, right? First he's walking in the counsel of the wicked, then standing in the way of sinners, and then before you know it, sitting in the seat of scoffers. It's this, well, I'm just, just going to walk with him, it'll be okay. I'm not doing what they're doing, but I'm, I'm just kind of walking with them. And then before you know it, it's like, right, you kind of like huddled up with them, right? Like, okay, what's going on? What's going on? And then the next thing you know, you're sitting right down in the midst of it. And so it's this, it's this process. Matthew chapter 5, 27 through 30, kind of a long one here. I'll read it, but this is Jesus talking. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. And once again, we see this progression, right? First, there's the look. Then there's the intent in the, in the heart, in the mind. And then he's talking about your right hand causing you to sin. There's the action, right? So it's this progression. It's this process. If you allow yourself to look or you allow yourself to dwell on something, and it's this example here is lust, but it, it applies to anything, whether it's bitterness, anger, right, jealousy, whatever it is, you, you begin to look at that, and you begin to think about it. And if you allow yourself to think about it too long, you begin to act it out. And before you know it, you're right there in the midst of that, that place that you know you shouldn't be in. I think about the story of, of Lot when I think about this process. You know, people don't just wake up one morning and they're like, oh, I think I'll cheat on my spouse today, right? Or, oh, I think I'm going to slander my neighbor. Like, it's not the, it's not, you don't just wake up doing that, right? There's this process that leads you to it. And when, we, when you look at the story of Lot, and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but when Abram gets his set of land and, and Lot goes his way, it says that Lot um, pitched his tent as far as, or among the cities as far as Sodom and Gomorrah, as far as Sodom. And so in that first section, we see that he's still like 
He's still living in a tent, right? He's still like this tent kind of dwelling person. He's among the cities, right? He's not like in them. He's not doing, you know, he's not right within them, but he's among the cities. The next time that we find Lot is when the angel of the Lord appears to Abram and, and tells him what his plans are um, as far as Sodom and Gomorrah, that he's going to have to destroy the city. And the Bible says that Lot at that point is living in the city. In fact, when the angel of the Lord goes there, Lot is standing in the gate of Sodom and Gomorrah. So first, he's just dwelling among the people. He's still in his tent, right? He might still move here, maybe move there. But the next time that we find him, he's smack dab in the middle of, at that time, the most evil city probably on, on earth, right? That God was literally like, this city is so evil. It's so bad that I'm going to have to burn it to the ground, right? I'm going to have to... to to destroy it. And so, not to hark on that point, I know I've made it like three different times, but I, th- I think it's just important that as Christians, as believers, that we realize we've got to be careful. We've got to be on guard. We've got to recognize that temptation is a process. Um, it, it might start in one place, but if we're not careful, it will lead further and further down. And, and I don't mean to sound like doom and gloom, I think the great thing about recognizing that it is a process is that when w- is that we can then recognize when we're taking part in that process, right? So I can recognize when I take that first step or that second step, I can be like, oh, wait, wait a second. I know what's going on here. I've stepped a little too far into this. I'm, gi- I'm giving these thoughts a little bit more time than they deserve. Lord, help me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back, right? It's not like I'm just going to fall into it and, oh, I got no chance now, but it's If it is a process that we step into, then we also can take responsibility, ask the Lord to give us grace, to give us strength, and we can step back out, right? We can make that change. We can turn around, and we can do what we need to do to resist, to flee from that temptation. All right, cool. So that leads to going to start kind of winding this down. I wanted to just throw this in. If we're not, if we're praying to be led away from temptation, then what should we be praying to be led into? There you go, righteousness. Right? So it's not just, it's not just that we pray against the temptation, but I think we also need to be actively praying that God would lead us into, and you nailed it there, brother, that he would lead us into righteousness. Psalm chapter 23, this is something that we, everyone's probably got this memorized, but the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, right? And so I think we recognize, Lord, lead us out of temptation. Lead us not into it. Help us to resist those things. But also, Father, lead me on the paths of righteousness. Lead me into your name. Lead me into your way. Lead me into your house. Colossians 1, 9 through 11 says, From the day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. This is Paul um, praying here or writing here his prayer. But he's asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding Here's the key. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance with, and patience with joy. Ephesians 1, 16 to 19. I, I'm not going to read the whole, um, the whole verse, but he's praying, you know, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Open the eyes of our heart. Enlighten us that we might know the hope to which you've called us. And so we can pray these prayers. Lord, lead me in righteousness. Lead me into truth. Lead me into a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Teach me who you are and show me what paths you desire for me to walk on. This should be our desire as Christians. Father, lead us in righteousness. We want to live holy and blameless lives. We want to live before you. We want to be able to ascend the hill of the Lord with clean hands and and a pure heart. And the most beautiful thing is when we do mess up, when we do stumble, when we do have those moments where we've given into temptation, we can come before God boldly as a good father and say, Father, forgive me. I take responsibility. I've, I've stumbled. I've messed up. But restore me in the path of righteousness. 
lead me back into the paths of righteousness where I belong. And this is our desire. All right, so the last part, in a, in, and I know there's probably way more that we could dig out of this. Um, unfortunately, I didn't do a, a ton of extensive study on this part of it, so this will be kind of short. But the last part, and if you're reading in your Bible, you may see a footnote to the bottom where it may be right there. It may not be anything at all. Um, after that prayer is this phrase, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And in this this doxology here, like, right, this like this short hymn of pray of praise of prayer, um, the reason that it's not in a lot of the, the different versions that you may have is because this wasn't part of the earliest uh, manuscripts. Um, it was a, a later edition. Um, but though this may not have been the exact words that Jesus concluded his prayer with, right? He may not have said this every time or it, it may not have been in this teaching he certainly lived this concept out right he certainly lived out the kingdom and the power and the glory i believe it's still theologically correct and it's completely um, a good thing for us to add into this prayer and it comes from first chronicles this is a prayer of david um, chapter 29 11 through 13 when they were dedicating the temple it says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And so I, I believe we can, in this prayer, just proclaiming, God, yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Yours is the kingdom. And I kind of just wrote it like this, and I love the order that it's in, even just practically. But we exist to build your kingdom by your power for your glory. And if, I mean, if that's not the mission statement of the church, then I don't know what is, right? God, we exist for your kingdom. We want to build your kingdom, right? If this is a kingdom, then you're the king. Come and exercise your dominion on every sphere of our life. Come and exercise your authority in our lives, not just when I'm in church, but at my workplace, in my family, every 24-7, I want to be thinking about building your kingdom. And it's by your power, right? We talked about temptation and how the, how the enemy's lurking and waiting for opportunities. And, you know, if we're not careful, we can just kind of live in this constant spirit of fear. But you know what? We serve the one who overcame death, hell, and the grave. We serve the one, um, like you pointed out, that overcame those temptations in the wilderness and has the power to give us to, or can give us the power to do the same thing in our lives, right? Yours is the power. It's by your power that we can act these scriptures out, that we can live this prayer, that we can make it a reality in our lives. Not our own power, not our own strength, not something I can do by myself, but God, it's your power. And finally, it's for your glory. We don't do any of this to brag on ourselves, right? Like, man, I overcame a couple big temptations today, right? Feeling pretty good about myself, right? I don't think anyone ever says that. It's a lame example, right? I, don't, I hope no one just like at the end of the day is like, oh, overcame those couple big temptations today, right? But it is like just a practical thing. Like, God, everything that we do in life is for your glory, right? We do it for your glory, and also, we, we do it to see your glory manifested, to see your glory made present on earth and in our lives. And so I think it's a great way to just end that prayer, to end um, even just our time of prayer. God, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. So let me pray. We'll close this out. And then if you guys have any comments, questions, concerns, anything like that, we can get to them. But um, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you didn't leave us alone, but you left us even with practical instruction on how to pray, how to live our lives. And so, Jesus, we, we model this, we make this our prayer tonight, even as you prayed, that, Lord, you would lead us not into temptation, 
but that you would deliver us from evil. Father, we pray that you would lead us into paths of righteousness, that as a church, as a body, Lord, as a, a father, as a husband, that I would be someone who would be holy and righteous. Lord, that we would be burning ones who um, didn't live weighted down by shame and guilt, but we would live as overcomers. Lord, that we would live uh, by your word and we would use your word in every situation and every season. And so, Father, we just pray that you would make us holy, that you would make us pure. We pray for just the strength today that um, anyone in here that might be dealing with temptation or dealing with um, just thoughts of shame or guilt, that even now that you would just remove those, that you would give us uh, just revelation on the power that is available for us, revelation on the goodness um, and the good Father that you are. And Lord, that we would just leave here confident in our, our position, confident in our identity as sons and daughters of the Father, sons and daughters of the King. Lord, that we would be able to usher in your kingdom wherever we go. And we just say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives, God. That yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever. And we live, Lord, we exist for you. And we just thank you. I thank you for this opportunity tonight. I just pray that it would encourage each one that heard it. Lord, that you would just continue to give us revelation on how to resist temptation. Continue to give us revelation on how to live lives of righteousness. Continue to give us revelation on how to ascend the hill of the Lord. Jesus, we thank you. We bless your name. Amen.